Hello and welcome to Roll to Cast, Baby Beard Media's uh, tabletop RPG podcast. Uh, I am Phil, and this week I'm joined by Sean and Ellen, and uh, we're continuing our interseason content this week. Uh, this is the last week of our interseason content, and we've got something we're really, really, really excited about. So, Ooh. joining us today um, is the creator of Cyberpunk 2020, the game we played in our first season, and founder of Our Telsorian Games, Mike Pondsmith. Welcome, Mike. Hi there. So I hear you guys have something really exciting going on. Can I watch? <laughs> 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 Whenever you want, Mike, really. Yeah. Just <laughs> great, great. You can be a voyeur for our podcast. That's right. Ah, yeah. uh, yes. I've been watching you all this time. <laughs> oh, no. I knew we should have taped over the camera on our computer. Damn it. Sadly, watching us podcast is not as interesting as when we put it all together with music. It's usually just us kind of furiously sweating and going. Um, what's five plus two? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Luckily, the power of editing um, lets us take those things out. <laughs> um, speaking of, of webcams being being taken over, um, where's this going? <laughs> well, I was just uh, I was just I didn't turn on my webcam because no one told me to. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> What about today's world do you think uh, you predicted correctly, Mike? Uh, there are a lot of things, but they weren't because I was particularly great at prediction, but rather <laughs> they're very obvious things. My son has always liked to tease me because I actually predicted the smartphone about six years before it happened. We had a thing called Agents in Cyberpunk, uh, basically 30X, and the agent was basically a largest cell phone that was set up to basically take what were called micro programs and download them from the net and do jobs like, for example, track your schedule, uh, allow you to order things online, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> et cetera. And, I, and so my son, when he was about oh, 12, I think it was, was looking through it and he said, Dad, you invented a smartphone. I said, yeah, I mean, you notice I'm not rich. Yeah. <laughs> I, guess, I guess conversely, though, uh, the other question I wanted to ask you is, what did you get the most hilariously wrong about what 2020 is going to be like? So let's, let's, let's go to the other side of the coin. Uh, I haven't got my flying car yet, but everybody complains about that. Yeah. Um, I think what I probably got... I wouldn't say wrong is that the entire corporate overthrow of, of the planet has been a lot more subtle. They've learned how to make a corporation seem like a very, very happy, your friend sort of thing. Yeah. So it's not mm -hmm. as much, hello there, we are evil corporation. Watching. <laughs> Instead, more like, well, Astro Zenelosica and our groups are together to help you find the life that you're looking forward to. Okay. You almost yes. weren't cynical enough. I know. I'm just yeah. like, that sounds great. Where do I sign up? <laughs> Please, can I get my starter pack? That's kind of what I noticed was that we, we did the corporate thing as we did essentially the Blade Runner thing. And it, we did it in a way where everything looks kind of nice, actually. Mm. Mm. So I don't think we see it coming sometimes. I guess as a storytelling point in, in Cyberpunk, it's kind of like it does have something to push back against because it is a lot more, well, honest in, in it, how kind of complicit these uh, companies are in kind of overthrowing us and enslaving us. So it, it makes these punks kind of fight back, whereas today it's more insidious. So it's really hard to kind of like pinpoint something. You can't just like grab your mates, yeah, grab, against, forks yeah, and get grab on the an streets. axe yeah. and go, fuck the man. It's more like, maybe I won't buy an apple, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it, it requires that we actually become much more media savvy than we've ever done before. I find it's kind of interesting. Uh, we have in the States at least a thing right now where um, a lot of people are saying older people kind of buy in on the press and, you know, what we would now think maybe might be fake news or things that, you know, generated essentially is propaganda. And I, you know, point out to them, well, you've got to remember, we're talking a period of time when people trusted Walter Cronkite, when the news actually was the news and there weren't a lot of possible outlets for that. So, it means that it evolves new skills of translating information, propaganda, and so forth 
that entire generations never had to have before. Puts me in mind of, uh, without getting uh, too controversial, Ooh. what's happening in, in, in Hong Kong and how they've oh, adapted yeah. with their use of social media and their use of, yeah. of tactics. And that feels like it comes straight out of Akira or, mm. or um, oh, yeah. and if it, any kind of cyberpunk media of that time. Mm. Um, is, is that something you felt you got right as well? That the kind of... The, yeah. The way yeah, I did the, read that. V3, which was uh, basically, as we call it, the green book, was a little more post, you know, transhuman. But one of the things I talked about very heavily in there was how media and propaganda and various types of tribalism affect information flow and perceptions of reality. The entire main element of how Cyberpunk V3 operated was about warring cultures who had decided their own versions of the truth and were determined to maintain those truths above all others. And that when there was no unified idea of a truth, you would have battles between what was true, quotation marks. How much of that has made it into red? Actually, a bit more. But with red, it's easier to see because (laughs) red is coming after things blew up and people don't have quite the (laughs) flexibility to, you know, waste time building alternate realities. They're too busy just making sure that everyone's eating. We kind of know that uh, Talzorian and yourself had been kind of thinking about Red for quite a number of years. So, like, despite what some people think, it's not something that's come about as a result of 2077. So, with that in mind, kind of what what generally sparks you to bring about a, a new version of Cyberpunk? Is it just when you feel that there's a lot more that you have to say, or is there usually just, like, a spark where you go, right, times have changed enough that we have, like, something more to contribute? How does that come about as each version comes to pass over the years? It comes about because we tend to treat the Cyberpunk universe as an ongoing story. So it has its own internal timelines, and those timelines have operated since the beginning. In other interviews, I've commented on the idea that we see the cyberpunk world as basically being kind of like the original Star Wars. So 2013 is effectively Star Wars. It's kind of rough. The basic elements are slammed down people can work with it then 2020 is basically empire strikes back it's deeper classic it's yeah (laughs) it's it's richer there's more backstory going on and a lot more about the world i mean there's tons of stuff you now know from empire that you would never suspected was going on when you look at star wars and then return of the jedi becomes basically 2077 in large part which is where things are are going to eventually end up. In fact, to be honest, 2077 is a little closer to the new trilogy with Red basically being the uh, Return of the Jedi. It's not the, the <laughs> Force Awakens expanded or universe kind of... We're, we're not <laughs> going no, into prequel trilogy I, here. I just love that, Mike, you're just outing yourself as a Star Wars fan. I'm loving this. <laughs> well, I worked on Star Wars products for a while, so, you know, with West End and others. So, oh, cool. you know, okay. I, I kind of got it to think that way. Um, (laughs) The important part is that because of that, we tend to think of how we're going to manage those story arcs in a way that you would look at managing a comic, for example. Right. Yeah. So, for example, by the time we got to 2020, many of the characters we had hints of, such as Morgan or especially Johnny Silverhand, were now established characters. Johnny isn't famous in 2013. Is this dude who has a band. Johnny in 2020 is not bigger than Elvis, but pretty big. By the time we reach Red, Johnny is a legend like Elvis. And nobody really knows all the story behind him. And there's a thousand legends built around him. So when we talk about arcs, one of the things I realized rather rapidly, in fact, my partner in crime, Dave Ackerman, who's our production manager and my best friend, and I sat around over several drunken nights and said, <laughs> you know, the world is the world is going to become pretty stagnant if we don't make some change ups. So we summer tail end um, 90s, early 2000s, we decided we're just going to blow the whole thing up. We'll have a tremendous war. We'll blow everything up and we'll have a chance to restart what the storyline is. And that's where Red came out of it. I'm interested to the kind of narrative and the story handling side of things. 
how do you approach uh, writing the system and and does that go back and forth with the narrative elements? Do they inform each other as you write them? Uh, I'm a great believer that the story on one hand serves the system, but that more importantly, the system has to illuminate the story. So that means when I go and I look at what's happening in red, I go, what are people doing in this time? How are they operating in this world? And then I go, how do I build systems that will reflect that? For example, in the original Cyberpunk 2020, you had people who didn't really work together in teams. They were kind of like a group of criminals who had to throw together occasional jobs. But by the time you reach the red period in 45, there's no slack for that. You either know what you're doing or you're dead. So it means that everybody who contributes into your team needs to have something they do and do it well, like you would have in a really good heist movie. Or, you know, the Avengers, you know, there's our green strong guy over there. Here's our leader, Captain America. Here's our tech guy over here in the Iron Man suit, blah, blah, blah. So... What we have done in red is we've really looked at both the roles and asked what do they contribute in this world? What do they do? And we've also asked what makes them more interesting to play now that people are aware of how a cyberpunk world works. Remember, when we wrote a lot of this. Nobody knew anything about this stuff. Mm. There's, you know, Now cyberpunk is sort of all over the place. And, you know, I'm proud to say we've had a fair amount of effect on that. But we have to train people and we had to fill in the gaps. Now people pretty much know what a fixer is going to do. They know what a net runner is going to do. So we can now go deeper. And that was one of the goals in red was to say, OK, in this world where these things are common, how are they affected? How do people play them? How do they use these roles? What are their jobs like? Can I jump off that in terms of I think one thing that people are really excited about or, or curious to know about in red is uh, how the role of the Netrunner is going to change mm. and, and how that's going to be more integrated. Because I think a lot of people kind of, for better or worse, they kind of uh, put it to one side. Well, um, we, which we definitely did. Mm-hmm. With we did as campaign. well. Yeah, we, we used it as a sort of background thing rather than have right. characters. There yeah. there actually was a really nice piece done. I saw it on YouTube today, as a matter of fact, where a gentleman who's been running as well talked about the fact that he had started integrating Red's net running system in to what was oh, going cool. on. I'll have to hook you guys up some point with, you know, what the URLs are or whatever. But it was mm-hmm. interesting because he saw what I was aiming to do. In the past, when we wrote 2020's net running We had two models, one of which was the real world Internet, which at that point was pretty darn primitive. You know, this was Usenet time. okay? (laughs) and then we had. Yeah, this is Stone Age. (laughs) Yeah. You you talk about Australian, you know, Internet now. But, you know, there was a time when we were slamming things against our phones and. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, I remember the the dial up. Get off the phone. I have to use the internet. (laughs) We're really, we're really high tech here, man. We have phones. But so the other side we had later was when I became more acquainted with William Gibson's work was the idea that there was this consensual visual concept. Neither one have really come true. One, the the Usenet level has now been subsumed into HTML code and then beyond. And the visual systems never really developed because there wasn't really a need for it. If you think about what the net is today, it's not flying through consensual space with things slamming against your eyes. No, you're reading a magazine that happens to be able to go anywhere. It's the world's biggest magazine. You know, you're, I think I'll go to this page. I think I'll flip to this page. I think I'll flip to this. <laughs> oh, look, the artwork on this page can move. Oh, this is cool. Somebody's cat. Dot, dot, <laughs> dot. So, yeah, basically we had to set it up with the knowledge base people had. In red, I asked, okay, assuming that we have an internet that's not structured like what we have now, what would it be like? What would have happened if we kept the same Usenet-esque systems that we were sort of prophesying back in 2020? 
And also, what happens to those Internet systems when they become corrupted by essentially Internet warfare? You know, you've got horrible things that are popping up as viruses that can burn your brain out. People aren't going on the net and just saying, hey, I think I'll buy some, you know, new <laughs> shoes. <laughs> but, you know, when I went to get new shoes over here, something tried to burn my forebrain out. Well, that's <laughs> not Drained my accounts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah drain my accounts and brain, burn my brain. So yeah. Which is one awesome. of the things that came of that, I spent a bunch of time talking to friends of mine who work in electronic security. We basically concluded, one, everything was going to be air-gapped. You couldn't afford to have a universe of flying the net and going anywhere because it was too risky. So that meant you were going to have very, very tight, secure nets that might not be going any further than down the block or within a city. You didn't do, hey, let's go talk to Tokyo unless you had a really secure line. So it meant that stuff was periodic that access was going to be very limited and usually on site. So what does that mean? It means the net runner actually has to go with the party instead of sitting around in his bathtub somewhere mm-hmm. and going, hey, yeah. I'm, <laughs> that. I'm so cool. You know, now, he's, now he's in there with you getting shot at because he has to be there so that he can jack in or break into particular areas of hardware that are not accessible outside of that building. Which certainly makes for a more active Player. And, a, and a much yeah. more harrowing experience as yeah. well. I, yes. I mean, we we kind of did that with with our NPC net runner. We we made sure they had to come into the building to get access. That's how it all works in in seventy. Sorry, in uh, red. That's how it all works. And to some yeah. extent, by working with the seventy seven crew, we carried that forward. And you see kind of hints of that in how V does the net running stuff in seventy seven. It's an extrapolation of where we were going into 77 and with the like the heavy policing that the net has in that version as well it's like all part of it being a much more closed off space yeah. than we used to yes we literally we we sat down and we agreed between us that the larger net that we used to have where people flew around through the vast consensual hallucination didn't exist anymore that it had been pretty much locked off after the war and the rabbits and all the other bad stuff on there and so you were doing more of the personal sort of thing that someone like the Netwatch character or V would be doing. I go into a building, I hack an immediate system, I open doors, and I get the guy lifting weights to drop the weights on his head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love things like that. So um, <laughs> what happened was the system is much faster. It is intuitive. The player as a net runner runs in the same cycle as the rest of the other players. So that means that he's now just another person, except that his weapons happen to be dealing with things that are generally intangible to the rest of the players. However, he's also wearing VR goggles, not because he's buried in this vast hallucinatory environment, but now he has to be able to see past all that. He can't just jack in and turn his brain off. He's walking around a building, so he's got to be able to see where he's walking as well as the stuff coming at him through the net. So it's more like augmented reality than... It's than augmented virtual. reality, exactly. Mm. Yeah. The result is that we, we get a very much more integrated to the party type of net runner. He's running on the same time clock as the rest of the players. And because of the nature of the changes in that net system, he's also dealing with threats that can just as easily attack his party in, in meat space as they can in net space. So your party could be going along and all of a sudden the, the, you know, the demon on the other side of, you know, the net looks at you and says, ah, you guys walked into this room and I'm about to seal all the doors and flood it with poison gas. And the net runner is desperately trying to kill the demon. And the rest of the party is trying to punch holes in the wall. And some people are trying to get their masks on and some people are just flat dying. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you're, you're actually quite famous for being quite brutal when you run games and, and, Characters dying being quite common. Yes. We, uh, is yeah. that fair? Chris kind of showed us the image, yeah. We have a running gag, which is, you know, <laughs> after a while, people people started wearing T-shirts that said, I survived a cyberpunk game with Mike Pondsmith. <laughs> <laughs> is that something you, you you encourage other people to do when they run the game, to, to run it in that brutal way? I take my running style from many, many years ago, uh, Roger Moore of TSR. He's a great guy 
who wrote a thing called Tucker's Cobalts. Tucker's Cobalts is a really, really great article where he said, why do we assume the guys living in the dungeon are stupid? They're not. If you have guys coming in and stealing your stuff and shooting your friends with crossbow bolts, you've probably decided on ways to deal with that. My games are deadly only in as much as my opposition is a thinking opposition. It's not like when you go into Arasaka, there's a bunch of dumb guards all sitting around. This is the world's most powerful security company. You'd better be ready to face some really ugly stuff because these guys shouldn't be standing around with their thumbs up their noses. It wouldn't mm-hmm. happen in real life either. It should be extremely difficult to get the jump on them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one of us, one of us survived our campaign. That we <laughs> yeah. Did. We yeah. started with three characters and ended with one. I think one reason Cyberpunk has had their reputation and people still like that is that they know if they got through it, they did not get through it because the referee was nice to them. They got through it because they had to think about the plan, figure out what's going on. You know, I, I was watching uh, Ocean's Eleven not too long ago. And then Ocean's 12. And then, I mean, it was a whole thing. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but I kept looking at it as a cyberpunk run and going, yeah, this is perfect cyberpunk run. And how many times did the plan go wrong that somebody should have ended up dead? They should have killed that guy. You know, he blew it. And yeah, Bernie Mac should have been dead right there. You know, <laughs> you never you never feel like they're in that much danger in that in that film. Like they're not. Yeah, they're, they're going to put not going to mm. pull it off. And that yeah. reduces some of the tension. Yeah. yeah, I love the idea that basically half of it is going, oh, crap, I didn't think about this particular thing, and now it's come to hose me. But I, I think that uh, is a, the like we were talking about with Hong Kong, like, um, you know, when the corporations kind of step up, so do the punks. And so when mm-hmm. you have this adversary that is so much bigger than you, scarier than you, slicker than you, cooler than you, it makes for a really kind of like in playing the game, I really felt emotionally invested in it because every fucking opportunity, it was like, oh, now this now this guy is kind of turning around and giving you, you something. Now you're fucked here. Now like this has gone wrong. Someone's fumbled the role. The plan's fucked. And like that's what the book tells you to do when yeah. you're right. It yeah. tells you like. Like, do not let your characters, your players get comfortable. Yeah. Just hurt them yeah. and Are harass they comfortable? Them. Rob their apartment. Yeah. Yeah, but it makes for such an engaging experience. But what I, what I really love about that is, and, you know, Hong Kong is a good example of it, is, okay, so the government can do facial recognition. So everybody's now wearing masks. And then when they ban masks, everybody finds another way to do it. And then when the helicopters are circling overhead and the drones, you're getting out pocket lasers. And basically... The amazing thing about technology is that technology is ubiquitous and the street will find uses for it. You know, I've been really surprised that so far that in the Hong Kong situation, for example, that we haven't seen any visibility of more, uh, so we say, offensive hacking. You know, what happens when, you know, the, the various systems that you're using to keep those helicopters in the air and the flight line records go missing? Or get tampered with. <laughs> it's very. This is very uh, a hot topic. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. People are now moving towards my house. And I'm going to have to get my guns. Out. <laughs> but we would hate it if anyone in Hong Kong wanted to do that for the revolution. Wink, 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 wink. Um, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, no, not saying that. At any rate, the upshot <laughs> is that yeah, technology is a great leveler, and that's one of the things about cyberpunk is that. I don't see it as just, wow, I have cool cyberware, but how do I use that technology to level an uneven playing field? Mm. To how change my need, world, right? Yeah, how do I do the change up? Uh, speaking of all the, the technology and everything that's available in the world, there are so many uh, supplements for, for 2020. You guys were really prolific. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm really excited to see what's coming out for Red. Uh, do you have any kind of... Uh, hints about what kind of splat <laughs> oh. books are in the works or what's coming out with the full release? Actually, yeah. Weirdly enough, I already put together, we have one entire uh, supplement that's been written and we're already buying and putting art together for it um, called Black Chrome, which will be a Chromebook. Mm-hmm. But in addition to just you know having the cool Chromebook stuff, it's basically a guide to how to use this new environment. So we talk a lot about economics. We talk about how systems work. For example, 
we don't really have in the period that we're talking about in red the same kind of infrastructure that allows for easy uh, access to things. So, for example, now you don't have somebody who will make your kibble by the ton and deliver it because you don't have a 1711 and you don't have a kibble factory because that got bombed during the war. So all of a sudden people are growing food on rooftops, but then other people are being hired to make sure that that food stays there and that the people who own it actually are able to, to harvest that food. And then other people are trying to take it. Um, one of the things that fascinated me was the idea that food, shelter are expensive, but technology is just unbelievably cheap. It's, it's ubiquitous. It doesn't break down very often. And it can go obsolete, but if you don't have something to make it obsolete, nothing new coming on the, the you know horizon, that technology can last a ridiculous time. Uh, for example, in red, we have still cell phones, but we don't have a lot of new cell phones because most of the companies that did cell phones between supply, supply chains, information breakdown, factories being wiped out, whatever, they aren't making a lot of cell phones for a while. But before you go, oh, God, that means we're, you know, we're, we're running around like Mad Max. No, we're not. You know, last year I was reading something fascinating. It was like three billion cell phones were made last year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I thought, you know, they've got to be kidding. And then I realized, like, everybody I know has, has one or two cell phones. You know, I have five cell phones. I'm kind of, <laughs> and they all do I'd different things. I'd be disappointed things. if you did. <laughs> one for each hand. <laughs> uh, well, some of, them, some of them are. I have, for example, a cell phone I take when I go on a uh, field digs I, I, i'm an amateur paleontologist so when i go on field digs i have one that essentially will drive uh are you still there yeah i've got yeah, one yeah, that's so that's so we're we're still yeah. you're burying the lead there yeah. i want to do an episode about my pond smith the paleontologist <laughs> burying the lead uh, hi very good <laughs> he, he, that's right most people don't know about that weird side of me yeah i <laughs> i'm an amateur paleontologist my i spend my weekends <laughs> at a museum Digging out parts of Triceratopses this week. Cool. Wow. As well as the T Rex, but everybody has to work on the T Rex because it's a horrible, yeah. horrible dig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it. It was like, what are the degrees of kind of amateur paleontology? This is one of them. You just kind of go out into a field with a shovel and you're just like, I'm ready, world. <laughs> uh, actually, we're always looking for, for bodies to go, you know, hack, <laughs> hack the things out of the rocks. In fact, one of the best digs I was ever on was through uh, some some people I know through Monash. And we went out and basically moved several tons of sand, got jackhammers out, and went and dug up Linellosauruses. But that's okay. a whole Holy other story. Shit. We are still talking to Mike Pondsmith, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, you went down this rat hole. <laughs> no, I, I, we love it. There, yeah. was, there was a fun anecdote at the top of this. <laughs> uh, I just want to hear more about yeah. dinosaur bones now. <laughs> Fuck. Nah, nah, no more. You got your dinosaur bones. That's Damn. it. Oh, no. Damn it. So, but what I'm saying is if every cell phone ceased to be produced for the next 10 years, those three billion cell phones would be out there somewhere, and most of them would be sitting there in shipping containers or warehouses or yeah. on trains that got stopped. So your your entire economy becomes, what did we find? Where was it? Was it stuck on a boat somewhere? Is it in you know one of a billion containers? Is it you know sitting on a dock in Singapore somewhere? And look, I found an entire I found an entire thing of cell phones that are relatively modern, you know, Samuel phones or whatever, Samsung phones that are, you know, Samsung nine instead of 12. Yeah, but they work (laughs) and they still work. So people are going to be able to maintain technological bases. Then in addition, you're going to get a lot more personalized stuff. For example, you know, we have um basically 3D digital printers at Talsorian. And we can make things as we need them. Our systems are not that sophisticated. I mean, you know, this was a pretty inexpensive thing. But, you know, and we also have have uh, digital printers as well. So we can, you know, print entire books off, which is really wild. 
I can dump a file and come out and like 15 minutes later, I have a bunch of books coming out the other end of the printer, complete, bound, everything in color. Really scary. (laughs) Yeah, and then the the, the characters are going to have, you know, access to to kind of similar technology to to kind of make what their imaginations see real, right? Mm -hmm. And then techies will have more things to do yeah. like putting technology back together or combining it or maintaining mm-hmm. it. making new stuff personalized technologies will become a big thing your techie may be the the only guy who makes that particular type of weapon makes that particular kind of scope whatever i'm a bit curious to how the world of red has affected style because in cyberpunk it's it's all you know, it's flashy. It's that kind of, um, you know, the haves, the haves, nots. Everyone's trying to establish themselves with their own sense of fashion, with their own sense of style, what's cool. And if the world of red is a bit more, not survivalist, but there is a bit more focus on kind of, we don't have these mass resources and we might not have these kind of bustling subcultures. So then is it kind of like a similar approach to even fashion? Is it more, what can I find? What makes it personal or is it kind of like, you know, does a, uh, could you strap a belt of phones on you as a kind of like (laughs) status symbol and be like, this is fucking high fashion now, bitch. Like, (laughs) yeah, basically what happens is, um, you don't get what I call flat board culture. You know, if, you know, the Kardashians do something, everybody sees it and then they decide whether they're going to go with it or not. Yeah. Instead. This might be in Seattle, we're wearing this. In Los Angeles, we're wearing this. You know, when I go to Los Angeles, I always walk around going, my God, people all dress like Michael Jackson did back in like the 2000s. You know, and they're still doing it. I'm just amazed. Right now, but as we speak. That's their style. So what happens, I think, is as you go between places, there will be changes in fashion. There will be a lot of turnover. Uh, there will be retro and new stuff coming up all the time, and it will be less dictated by kind of an uber fashion and more what are the people in this group into? What do they like? So it's going to have a little more found quality to it, and it's going to be all over the board depending on where you That's are. So, super exciting. Yeah, as someone yeah. who loves fashion. Yeah. So, and, and so a big part of 2020 is, is the gangs and the themed gangs. Are they making oh, yeah. a return in, in red or are there new ones that you want to you highlight? New ones, there are new ones and there's some uh, ev- evolutions. I, I've had a really great time messing around with <laughs> the crew over CD. For example, when I started, the Voodoo Boys were one group. And now they've mutated into another group. And I just love what's being done there. I just absolutely love it. They're the, they're the Haitian gang, that's right. Yeah, they're the Haitian group now. But I love the idea that a bunch of Haitians basically came in and said, you know, you guys <laughs> who are acting like you know our culture, get out of here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Take a hike, man. And then um, some of them, because we do keep the fan base filled in on what's gone before and that's been a very important part of how we've progressed the timeline forward it means people find out about things for example the bozos when when reddit first discovered the bozos people went oh right a gang of street gang clowns that is so stupid people like oh my (laughs) god i hope they don't have that in there it's gonna be really dumb and um my social media guy who's absolutely brilliant uh You've talked to him, Jay. That's Jay Jay. started actually putting up articles about the world. And he went into in depth what the bozos were really like. And they're they're a lot closer to, you know, Pennywise clown than anything. Yeah, they're they're vicious, cruel, evil. Everyone just collectively went, oh, oh. Oh, Yeah, yeah, they all kind of went, oh, yeah, okay. So next thing we knew was like, okay, I hope they put the bozos in. (laughs) So we could bring that forward. And so people now going, yeah, but what are the bozos going to be like after 45, 50 years? Oh, God. Whoa. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. there are hints of that, you know, in in red, for example, gee, there might be entire communities of bozos. Oh, good, mm. oh, good no. Lord, Mike. <laughs> That's so wild as well, because we literally had 
uh, what a clown was the, epidemic. What was it? Two thousand and seventeen or something? And it, and yeah, it's, it, it was started, very strange. You know, we, we just some... had we had people just dressing up as clowns and just kind of roaming highways and just deliberately Following trying people to around and freaking people. people out. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think it was, that was actually happening stateside, but we have a tendency to shoot at them when they do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised we didn't. I didn't hear about that in Adelaide, but I was like, wouldn't. Someone Everyone got just, killed doing that. Like, yeah. fight back against the clowns, which is a weird sentence, but. Like, <laughs> fight back yeah, against the clowns, exactly. man. <laughs> Up against the wall, clowns. <laughs> I, I like the bozos that uh, they represent for me an idea that sort of anything goes mm. in the uh-huh. world. And I think saying, oh, this is stupid, betrays a bit of a lack of imagination for, for what's possible. We oh, made. God, we. we yeah. We, uh, we're kind of proud of an addition that we made where we made yeah. a, a poser gang that was themed on Oliver Twist. <laughs> yeah, the um, twists. Yeah, and the way we made it a bit crueler and more cyberpunk is that it was a grown-up, uh, a Fagan, who had a bunch yeah. of prepubescent kids as his gang and he would get them to pickpocket and threaten people and that would that would that was effective because people were you don't know, don't know how to react yeah. to, to yeah. kids, yeah. you know, holding a knife to them, right? Adorable so, but terrifying. Adorable but terrifying. And, and I think... I the, the idea that bozos were in the game gave me the permission to be like, this isn't silly. This is this is fine. Oh, people, there are all kinds of people, people in this world. People will do anything. Like, yeah, if the Swiss cheese pervert exists. One of, one of the best gangs is a gang I invented a bunch of years back called the Gilligans. And it was based <laughs> yes. on this idea that there was a gang that essentially everyone took the roles of characters in the old TV show Gilligan's yes. Island. Okay. <laughs> Now, at first it seems kind of silly, and then you start thinking, <laughs> okay, if I come into a, a an area and there's 20 people who are all dressed as ginger, of all sexes, <laughs> sizes, and whatever, ginger with cyberware, Lord only knows what you've got, and they're all talking in that, you know, well, really, voice, and you're going, that just got creepy. <laughs> yeah, it's really and, disturbing, yeah. Oh, yeah. What and so what of? poser <laughs> gangs did was they, they warped the idea of, of basically how we deal with media culture and said, you mm. know, what do people decide they really want to live in Star Trek? Really? Yeah. You know, what would people do with this? And I always loved it because um, the bozos actually live on the island. Not bozos. The uh, Gilligans actually live on the island in the middle of the uh, lake in Night City, <laughs> which they have now done as a Pirates of the Caribbean slash – um, tropical <laughs> island, I guess, theme park. You want to think of it that way. So there you are in the lake. I remember somebody crashed an AV and they staggered onto the island and they heard, sit right back and you'll hear a tale. <laughs> <laughs> All done in minor keys. And they got to a three hour tour. 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 And they're screaming, and you can hear this these high falsetto screaming voices yelling, Skip it! And people were running for the water. I'll get back on the flaming AV for God's yeah, sake. Because right. yeah. when you see Gilligan chewing on an arm, you keep Oh, oh God, oh, yeah. It wants me to like now create, I want to see in Cyberpunk Red. A gang called the Morks. All <laughs> like, dressed up all as Robin Mork, Williams. All Robin Williams. <laughs> nano, nano. nano. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, well, interestingly stupid thing. You, you know that Robin Williams actually played cyberpunk. No. no. How do you know It doesn't this? surprise me. Because but... he, he, he basically contacted us when he was on Goodwill Hunting and he left his books behind. And he wanted oh, a copy oh of Night God. City. So we sent him a copy of Night City. Oh, oh that's amazing. That's that's, that's wonderful. That's fucking precious. That's that. he, got, he, got, he got dragged into it by my friend Sandy, who used to uh, play and run games at the game store we used to hang out in San Francisco. And wow. for years, he'd come in one end, I'd come in the other, we'd miss each other by like five minutes. <laughs> no, no Robert was here? Damn, I missed him. Hey, you know Mike was here? Damn, I missed him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, he. I, I. I. thought Sonny was having me on, and then you know we got this call saying, you know, actually it was one of his reps at first saying, can we get a copy of Night City because Robin's running and he doesn't have a copy, so he left it back home. And I'm like, wow, sure, whatever you want. <laughs> cool. I made it. Yeah, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah, I'm there. I, I bet he was a vicious de- uh, referee as well. Uh, uh, I. I would pay. I would have paid a lot of money to oh. see. That Oh, and he would have done all the voices. Oh, oh, oh my God. He would be so good. I know, yeah. I know. Sad. 
So at any rate, yeah, basically the thing about about red is that red gives us more room to explore and it gives us a chance to actually expand those cultures. What's happening in red is after Night City gets nuked, there's a whole lot of Night City nobody can live in. And while the nomads are scraping it back into the bay, the more radioactive parts, there's a lot of places that are just uninhabitable. So people start going back out to the abandoned cities and towns around the area and then further west and east, wherever they can, to reestablish stuff. So you have different cultures popping up. You have different groups popping up. You have a lot more of a fragmented culture. And then the fascinating part is that what we've done in 77 is to show how we eventually rebuild the United States from all these colony expansions out of Night City. And the kind of re-urbanization of yeah. the culture. Yeah. Mm. Um, so the the idea of, of California being the free republic That's and, right. and yeah. separating, uh-huh. where did that come from? That's Is that present in the really early editions of Cyberpunk? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically, you know, I looked at it and said, you know, if you really got down to it, California and Texas probably could say goodbye to the rest of the United <laughs> States because their GP, you know, their GNPs are the equivalent of like many small nations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think California rates like it's like the 10th biggest economy in the world or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's literally it's a country in and of itself. So, you know, if the United States government were going to, you know, hell in a handbasket, it wouldn't take much to convince, you know, San Francisco down to, you know, the midline to say, yeah, OK, we're not going to kind of go along with this crazy. And Seattle would go along with that. Vancouver across the border would probably go along with it. And next thing you know, you've got the NorCal Free State. Texas can do the same sort of thing. And there are, you know, several places throughout the country where they could, if they didn't like where the states were going, they could split. And it wouldn't be impossible. I was curious about it from the economics because if I break it off from the traditional United States, I can have a lot wilder place. I can have more stuff going on. But it also isn't inconceivable that it could happen. And the setting as well, Night City is now iconic. Yeah. Um, as as yeah. You know, Not everyone plays in Night City, um, but it, it is the, where, where most people games are set and that's where most of the, the lore that's been created focuses on. Um, was there any tension in the decision to kind of make a fictional city in the, in the real world? Or did you want to, did you discuss setting it in sort of San Francisco or? or, or I, a, I was a originally going to do it in San, I was going to do it in San Francisco and the problem was, is that there's too much back history. Mm. And I have to account for that. So what I ended up doing was I was coming up the um, I was coming up Highway One, and I always ended up passing this place called Morro Bay. And Morro Bay is this nice little community. It's you know oceanside and has a park and all that stuff, and it's big, humongous rock. And I used to ride through there and go, okay, time stop, get myself something to eat and all that. And I said, this is right on the border between NorCal and SoCal because it's where I always stop my way from, you know, coming up to, to, you know, Northern California from L.A. And I went, well, I I could put it here. There's nothing here. really. It's just a little town. (laughs) And no one's ever going to know where the hell it is, you know. (laughs) And so I put it in there. And then, you know, years later, people were like, it's it's here and it's here. And I'm going, no, 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 it's in here. (laughs) And probably the town of Morro Bay hates me now. <laughs> you know, the town of Morro Bay absolutely probably hates me. They're like, my punishment just totally screw up our town. <laughs> I needed a town that I could shape to my own desires, and I needed to put it essentially on the boundary between Northern and Southern California so I could get L.A. crazy on one side mm-hmm. and kind of high-tech reticence on the other side. The hybrid of the two sensibilities yeah. of the two mm-hmm. cities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really clear in the in the in the law for it. Yeah, it's kind of interesting just cuz like kind of thinking back now you're talking especially about your history and how things came about and all these past games, you know, when you and this is such a broad question, but when you look back on like 30 years of you're now in the industry, you've gone from self-publishing a game about a Japanese anime big fucking fighting robots, robots. Yeah. then you you know you found a company this takes off you you start this cyberpunk which then gets version after version and you're constantly kind of 
when you reflect back on 30 years, w- what do you think are some of kind of the biggest lessons that you've learned in terms of how you progress as a game developer and how you kind of um, move with the times and move with how things change, especially now you're at a point where... All eyes are on you. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, my, my first realization was, God, I've managed to convince people to pay me to do this for this long? Wow. <laughs> when I first started this, my mother said, when are you going to get a real job, Michael? <laughs> and this was, I'd been doing this for like five years already. I had a company and she's going, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> she did not believe I... She didn't believe I had a real job until I joined Microsoft. (laughs) Uh, Oh, no, that's a real job. (laughs) So um, it's actually weird because my son now is a designer. He's just done his first major project, which is the Witcher tabletop. That's Cody, yes. Yeah, that's Cody. And uh, basically, it's fascinating to watch him step into the shoes because he's doing a hell of a job. But what I've learned is... It's about stories and people like to hear diff- different and interesting stories and that games basically allow people to shape the story to fit what they would like to do with it, particularly tabletop. But to be honest, with games, for example, like The Witcher or what we're doing in 77, the ability to shape that story becomes even more of a, an impact thing. It becomes something that people can look forward to. Can immerse themselves in that in that world. Yeah, people talk about, you know, like what's going to be a Night City and all that as though it's going to be laid out for them. And the best part of Night City for me has been just wandering around the environments that I can get into so far and going, oh, I never thought that was, oh, that's a great view. Oh, wait, that guy <laughs> yeah. over there has got a weird-ass gun. Oh, I wonder if I can do this. <laughs> oh, you know, and that's going to be there throughout the entire game, these moments when you'll go, hmm. There's a possibility. <laughs> as, as for a career, like I said, I feel incredibly lucky that, you know, I, it's not that I didn't work hard to do it, but that the world really likes the ideas. Um, I look at what I write and what we aim for with an eye towards what popular culture will be doing. I didn't, for example, do a giant robot game just because I like giant robots, although I do. But I looked at it and said, this is going to be huge in the United States. This is already starting to be huge in Japan. This will be huge in the United States. I have a confession <laughs> that, that one of the reasons we did Cyberpunk is because it's what people are into right now. It's mm. we just, one of the reasons we decided to play it. Yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's what people want. in pop culture yeah. right now. Tapping into the zeitgeist as well. Uh, yeah. yeah, you used my exact words there, tapping into the zeitgeist. Nice. I talk about the zeitgeist <laughs> a lot. And yeah, um, I spent I spent a lot of time wandering around through, you know, toy stores and game stores and all that, just listening and finding out what people are getting into, Hmm. you know, and you can learn a tremendous amount by listening, not talking. Hmm. Yeah. So if we have one, I'm just saying, we're not good in a podcast, not good on a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's this weird zeitgeist thing going on. And it's it's very strange because. You know, we and CD happen to hit exactly not just the right time, but I think we have a particular kind of cyberpunk that hasn't really been done before. And it it sounds goofy to say it, but our cyberpunk is more fun instead of depressing. (laughs) (laughs) It is. It's more it's less philosophical and contemplative than it is anarchic. Yeah. Rebellious. Bingo. uh, And it's it's something you can get your teeth into, which I think is really appealing. You just don't have the fucking time as a punk. Like, you don't, you know, everything's moving around you. And if you don't move too, you're you're It's gritty without being dour. Yeah. Well, the problem problem was that the, the term cyberpunk didn't really express, in, in my humble opinion, the punk aspects of it, which was these are people who don't give a fuck, are in your face, and are doing what they're going to do. And if you get on their case, they're just as likely to put a hobnail boot in your butt. <laughs> and this was this is not the same world as Deckard. I love Blade Runner, but there are occasional moments when I just go, yeah, you know, actually, my hero in this isn't Deckard. It's Roy Batty. Yeah. You know, Roy, yeah. Batty's, Roy Batty's not going to live long, but, man, he's going to live wide and high. I mean, Deckard and K.O. are nice to watch, but I don't think they're that fun to play. No. And, and that's because, you know, in that kind of cyberpunk structure, it's, one, very philosophical, very intellectual, and also it reinforces the idea that, the system is so big it grinds you up. 
But, you know, when I look at it, I go, there's a place in there for Major Matoko on one side, you know, who works for the man and kind of defines the man. And, you know, somebody who basically gets in the face of the man. I mean, when I look at a character along that line, I look at Billy Idol from way the hell back in the 80s. And I go, yeah, that guy, that guy kind of had what was going on. Do you find there's a lot of room for um, social commentary elements to, to creep into tabletop games? And, and you actually kind of forge stories that, that speak to the issues that people want to explore in person? Or does it, is it more of a room to to just kind of kick back and have fun? Um, I put social issues in, but as, as I said in another interview, I don't preach those issues. Uh, we live in an, for example, I don't have to go out of my way making a diverse world. I live in a diverse world. And if I just write what I see reflected in the world that's around me, it's pretty simple, you know, that that world is going to be a certain way and it's going to stylistically you know, hit people different ways. One of the things I try to avoid is preaching. I, I basically let the stuff sit there like landmines. And one day somebody goes, oh, crap, that's what that means. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that. And that's, I think, a good way to do it is to have people, you know, as they say, the street finds its uses for things, you know, according to Gibson, the street finds its uses for the stuff I write. People are going to find ways to fit that into their worldview one way or the other. Yeah, I don't write things and go, yeah, I'm going to tell them what this means. I'm going to go, <laughs> okay, so here, here is the way it is, and this is probably the way it's going to shake out. And, you know, figure out what you want to do with that. It might yeah. not be mm-hmm. as pleasant as you think. Uh, with that, is there any kind of uh, stories that you kind of gra- gravitate towards telling? Like, is there an element of, of something that you like to kind of involve in in every kind of game that you write or even what kind of stories do you gravitate to as a, as a player and as a viewer? Um, I'm interested in personal stories. I'm interested in what people do with the opportunities in the worlds I create. You know, if, for example, Mecton, you know, I, I have a rewrite on Mecton that one of these days when I get out from underneath all this, I'm going to finish. <laughs> Good I was not that. expecting to spend my life in, in Poland, you know, and that sort of thing. <laughs> but I asked a question a couple of years back with Mecton. I said, you know, we never really asked in a society where they're giant robots, what would that society be like? You know, what if that society wasn't, you know, guys who fight wars have giant robots? What if it was, you know, your mom down the street owned a 15 <laughs> foot tall multi-ton giant robot what would oh, it look man. like how would she use she would it? do so much shopping in bulk oh. i'll tell you what <laughs> I, I have one of my favorite pieces of art i just love this piece for for mecton zero when it eventually gets out is a mom in a big four cockpit mecca and it's on yes. a street and she's got two kids in the back screaming bunch of groceries <laughs> and she's trying on one hand shut them up and then uh. down below, 20 feet below, is a traffic cop writing a ticket to her. Oh. And I love that scene because, you know, at some point, you know, I love the idea that mom is out, you know, beyond the city walls having a picnic. And one of the really big things that lives in Algol attacks the family. And she says, now, kids, stay right here. And she goes and jumps <laughs> in the Mecca and picks up some freaking bazooka and starts wailing on his dinosaur thing. And she goes back and says, all right. Johnny, where's Johnny? He's over there. Oh, <laughs> God dang it. She leaves in the back again, you know. But yeah. when people have that sort of technology, what will they do with it? How will they use it? I love the idea. Um, in Zero, I have this this one poor character, Jeff, who has gotten a really, really powerful, I mean, super-powered mecha. But he needs a job because he has to pay <laughs> You have to pay the loan off. And so he keeps going from place to place to place, and he keeps failing in these various jobs. So he's like, I guess I'll become a cowboy. I'll go out on the open range with my mecha and my, <laughs> my you know, protective weapons and my poncho for keeping the dust out, and I'll fight the big things that attack the giant gun fark that are out there. Well, failed in that one. What next? You know? <laughs> I guess I'll be a fireman. You know, at one point I have him, I have him literally working as a, as a guy who uh, is a car lot attendant and he has a Look big sliding shovel that he slides underneath the cars, lifts them up oh. and puts them in the car park. And that's his job. Like that. And yeah. then he takes a little ticket, you know, with an extruder, you know, and he's going to, okay, well, you're number 15. 
you know, and <laughs> later the guy comes back, you know, this girlfriend, they're drunk. And he, he holds the ticket up and Jeff slides the shovel underneath and hands the guy back his car. <laughs> Mike, you've told the story in the past about how at least one of, if not the first times you were kind of introduced to role playing in general was, I believe, in college when one of your uh, friends brought out D and D. I mean, oh yeah, I, I'm curious to know if you if you um, can still recall like what that felt like, like being presented with a role playing game for the first time. Because I mean, pulling the veil back, I myself and um, Ellen, we're fairly new to role playing. Yeah. Um, we started a few. I started a few years ago, at least when I played my very first game, and I can just still remember that kind of visceral kind of joy and just endorphins being released like oh we can we can do anything we mm. can create this new world there's just this like immense amount of just creativity and freedom that comes along with that like was that was what drew you to role playing and and do you credit that um scene at college with is kind of spring loaded you into this industry well here's here's my confession um one i blame a a good friend of mine who's passed on since Greg Worth for making me a geek. Greg, <laughs> Greg and I knew each other in college. We thank him. Yeah. Uh, and Greg, Greg was the cool dude who had a green Mustang, and we roared around Berkeley together. And he introduced me to naval war gaming. He introduced me to comics. He introduced me to Queen. He introduced me to alternative rock, and he Dang. introduced me to role playing. And at that point, I was kind of a boring guy, I think. But Greg <laughs> in, introduced me to all this stuff, and I went. Oh, where was this all my life? This is cool. <laughs> and so role playing was not as big a step because it was part of all of this world of geekdom that I was being exposed mm. to. I actually didn't get that far into it. I mean, we played occasionally and I had a good time. I had a, I had this character who was um, a paladin at that point. And we, we had a good time. When I really actually got into it was when I met my wife because she was gaming and she was one of the few women who gamed. And um, one of my my old friends from college, he was now um, basically a housemate of hers. They had a big, you know, kind of hippie house together. And he said, you got to meet Lisa. She games like you used to, you know. And I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> and turns out, one, she knew me. She had met me before in college and thought I was a jerk. So I still don't know how I got around that one. Well, that geeky stuff really mellowed you out. <laughs> no, uh, back when I met Lisa... The, the best way to describe me was I was Landor Carusian without a spaceship. Oh. Oh. Hey, baby, you truly belong among us in the stars. <laughs> 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 so I had a voice for it, so I could get away with it. But, you know, she kind of <laughs> met me the first time, rolled her eyes and said, yeah, okay, jerk. <laughs> so basically, in order to go out with her, I had to join her D&D game which was being run by her old boyfriend. And Holy shit. He wanted, to, he wanted me out of there so bad. And so it would be like, you know, I'd be out with my bard character. We're on a wall somewhere and we're fighting, you know, the hordes coming at us. And it'd be like, orcs, orcs, orcs. Yeah, Mike, you have a Balrog. <laughs> what? This is a great script for an 80s movie. This yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Actually, uh... I told this to Larry Niven a long, long time ago when we were working on Dream Park. And he said, you know, that would actually make a really good Dream Park scenario. It's <laughs> adorable. I love that the real quest was to woo your wife yes. and you didn't even know. The best part was that she was at that point, one of the people who'd introduced the role playing was a guy that I had known previously in an undergraduate career. And he was kind of a geek back then. But by the time she met him, he was this really smooth, sophisticated uh, pre-law. So, you know, it's like she's going, I want you to meet my GM, Bob. And I'm going, <laughs> oh, it's weird, Bob. And he's like, <laughs> die. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, basically for me, role playing kind of came along. I don't think it really hit me as a possibility till I one day stumbled across that black box with a red type. For Traveler. And I went, okay, this is what I was looking for. And uh, that was it. Traveler is where I became a game designer because I went back and immediately the first thing I found out was that it was incredibly difficult to kill somebody in Traveler. And I went, oh, that doesn't work. I have to rewrite that. So I ended up rewriting <laughs> like a whole bunch of rules in Traveler. And by the time I was done, I had a new set of rules called Imperial Star, 
which later became mech time. So, so is that a thing for you? Is is about int- kind of introducing more stakes to role playing? Is that what you had an interest in about actually? creating that tension and that sense of urgency when you play yeah yeah the the thing is is that i'm a better gm i think than a player i i I have add and i get bored easy you know (laughs) but i like figuring how the world works and my son is the same way so we're terrible to run but we run a pretty good game (laughs) and that's because we are always wondering how does the world work what will people do here what's interesting about it how can i make this even going down to the supermarket, a fun thing. Or the mall, in our case. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We talk about the, the kind of the zeitgeist and, and, and gaming. Gaming is... is uh, RPG tabletop gaming is, is cool. It's in. Mm. It's in yeah, right it's, now. It's way up again. Yeah, so that, that's, that's good for you guys, um, yep. uh, I'm guessing. Uh, it, how's this year been? And Has and it been busy? Has it been busy? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, is there it's anything, been busy. And obviously, we're big fans of cyberpunk, but is there anything else from Artel Sorin you'd like to, to sort of comment on or highlight mm. that, that you think people are sleeping on right now? Well, right now, what we're doing is we're getting caught up on one, Witcher, which has been incredibly successful. Yeah. And we've been having just to stay ahead of that. And then basically Cyberpunk Red, when we did the Jumpstart kit, we figured, yeah, people will be interested. We had no idea how insane it was <laughs> until like the second day of Gen Con when we had people literally wrapping around and going down for like seven aisles worth of Gen Con. Jeez. And we're sitting there going, oh, my God, we're going to be out in a half an hour. Yeah, we had to set we up a thousand digital. copies. <laughs> we're going to be out in a half an hour. You know? uh. It's like, oh, my God. So that has been it's it's been really crazy. Um, between that, the response for Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven, I thought it was going to be cool. I did not know how cool we could get it. And one of the fun parts is that I have been involved in it the whole time. And it's not like you know they took the baby and went away. It was like, so what do you want to do? Hey, we could do this. You know, how if we added that? So I've been involved in it the whole process, which has actually been a lot of fun. But it has also meant that, you know, I haven't been doing as much of the Talsorian stuff I need to do. The other <laughs> part, which is really weird, has been, jeez, um, I, I guess the way to put it is conferred fame. Since they keep putting me up on interviews, things like that, I now have people, like, come up and ask for interviews or, or uh, yeah, selfies, sorry about that. And, <laughs> selfies and autographs and things like that. And I'm going, you want my autograph? Yeah, can we get a <laughs> selfie? And I'm like... You want to get a picture of you with me? What? With yeah, Maximum dude. Mike. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, but, you know, I kind of figure, you know, it, it's making their day. I'm good. I'm good. You know, I mean, they're having a good time. I'm having a good time. It's nice meeting people. <laughs> but it is a little weird when my, my favorite, we bought my wife a new car and we're sitting there in a lot and she's just getting the keys. She's getting in, in her little black car and having a good time with it. And the guy leans over to me. And he says, so, April 19th can't come soon enough, can it? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going, okay, so we were this entire time buying this car. You didn't say anything. And you waited for this exact moment to say, yeah, I know you did sign. He was, I'm he not was even wearing my, my jacket. I'm not doing anything that says what I do. And he's like, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> Do you know Keanu I, Reeves? Can you? <laughs> no, I don't know Keanu Reeves. That's the funny part. Is we are always, once again, like Robin Williams, I he bet. and I are always passing in the night. Oh. I show up. I show up in in Warsaw about the time he's left Warsaw. I go down to do my recording, and he comes in the next week, and it's back mm. and forth. So, you know, probably one of these days I'm gonna be sitting there on a plane, and Keanu is gonna go, "Hey, so like." <laughs> He you would know, do exactly that. Should, you know, <laughs> now I'm imagining like, Keanu Reeves refereeing a game. Hey, whoa, I d- dude. I, d- I have no idea what he'd be like in that. You know, he seems like a pretty <laughs> chill dude, though. Yeah. Would it be all about and, Johnny? And I like I like his Johnny because his Johnny is is not the twenty the, the twenty twenty still got some hope Johnny. This is a pissed yes. off Johnny. You know, mm. and I'm kind of like, yeah, I can see this. Johnny was never really that patient. And, you know, I can see him being in this bad of mood. Like, yeah, we got to tear this whole place down. Damn it. It didn't work the last time. Is is him being like a construct? Is that a little nod to Neuromancer? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, I can't really tell you some things we know about it. Right. That, right, right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's some secrets that are hidden. Okay. And right. it may be worth it may be worth reading red because many of the secrets for what people did are buried in red. Uh, <laughs> you had it. Yeah, we, we, <laughs> we have I have a counterpart over at uh, CDPR, so I have a couple of them. But we will sit down and go, so what do we want to do with this character? Well, over here, we need to have them run a corporation. Okay, so over here, I'll have them starting, but this is why they're, you know, like starting a corporation like this. Okay, so what about this? You know, and we have this great time salting stuff in like landmines and hoping that one day somebody will be going through and they'll look at red and go, hey, wait a minute. That's where that guy came from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's that's the benefit of having you know a game with so much so much history. Mm. Thank you so much for being with us today. We won't keep you uh, any longer. You've been really really generous with your time and ah, uh, just no fantastic big. to talk to. Um, unless you want to talk for another five hours. Ah. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> it. No, no. I've actually promised a friend of mine that I'm going to join him at a game store and we're going to play Star Wars Armada and oh. see if we can blow each other's ships up. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. He's going to kick my butt. I know it. <laughs> so, yeah, as, as we said, first of all, yeah, thank you so much, Mike, for donating Thanks your for time and um, energy. Um, and also, just for those of uh, you listening, um, to just let you know, um, as we stated, this is the last in our four-part series before we gear up for season two. And um, while we are hoping to return to the cyberpunk world in a time in the future, for now, season two, starting next week, will be us dipping our toes into Vampire the Masquerade. Mm. Uh, so please come back for that, yes. You played that one? I've played it, but my son actually is the one who's played more of it, and uh, yeah, he I loves see. messing with it. <laughs> That's all I can <laughs> say. He, he plays the most atypical, you know, Ventru I've ever seen. It's like, I can't believe you're playing that character. Yeah, like, <laughs> your cat? <laughs> if you could just let him know that the podcast is starting. Yeah. No, okay. sure. He'll probably be checking it out. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. And obviously, you know what? Like, it seems like your Art oh, Town really kicking off. So, all, all the best yeah. for you guys. Yeah, I, yeah. I hope there's some a, success. Seems to be a company to watch out for. Yeah. <laughs> we hope you have a, a, so. as good a 2020 <laughs> as you've had a, a, a 2019, mate. Um, uh, have a have a great, great evening. We'll... we'll Maybe talk to you one one day later. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Thank okay. you so much. Have fun, guys. So, I've been Phil. I've been Sean. And I've been Ellen. Bye. Bye. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>